tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Horror Hill, Season 5. The grass is redder on the other side. I bet I wasn't who you were expecting. Well, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Eric Peabody, and I will be your temporary host of Horror Hill while our masterful leader takes a sabbatical. But fear not, he will be back in full form, and with more gusto than a malevolent Oopier greets the night with. Oopier is a fancy name for a vampire, for those who didn't know. See? We're already learning things. And knowledge is power, my friends. I hope you had a frighteningly fun Halloween with your ghosts and goblins. I suppose it's time to put away those decorations and trade our orange and black garland for that of red and gold. Spooky season is over, right? Wrong! Come on, this is Horror Hill, people, where it's spooky season all the time! <laughs> I think I pulled something during that. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archive dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. So, until we bring Sexy back, I have a story for you. One fraught with horrors and peril. And now, without further ado, from author W.B. Stickle, I give you The Red Room. The 
The Red Room by W. B. Stickle May 24, 1218 AM Christ, what a haul. I honestly don't know how truck drivers do this day in and day out. Sitting for eons on end, bored out of your skull, navigating legions of douchebags and minivans and SUVs who think they own the road, enduring construction zone after goddamn construction zone, all that through eastern Wyoming. More than once, I wanted to put a shotgun in my mouth. No thank you. Anyway, I'm here, finally. As you can imagine, it's late and I'm pretty bushed. I'm gonna sign off now, get a good night's rest, and buzz you in the morning. Love you guys. Kiss Katie for me. May 24, 8.47 a.m. Damn it, I had you there for a sec, but then you were gone. That looks like the signal's too weak out here in bumfuck Montana. All right, until I can figure something else out, I'll drive into town every couple of days and call you from there. In the meantime, it'll have to be dictated by texts and emails. As long as I can get a single bar for a few seconds, I can send those. In other news, as Chalmers promised, all the basics are in good shape here. The power's on, the heater puts out warm air, and the plumbing works fine. There's no cable or internet, but Chalmers says we can get satellite service if we decide to keep the compound. Okay, I'm off to do some more in-depth exploring. I'm going to start with the bunker and work my way topside. Wish me luck. Maybe there's gold in these here hills. Talk later. May 24, 12.58 p.m. Quick break for lunch. I figured I'd squeeze in my first update while I'm at it. The verdict thus far? Thumbs way up. Sure, it looks like something from that Doomsday Preppers show with all the pipes and conduits and shit running everywhere. But I have to say, old cousin Hank put a lot of work into this place. Apparently, in addition to being a complete fucking wackadoo, Hank was a regular Bob Vila. I'll send some pics later. For now, here's the gist. The compound sits inside a huge fenced-off area the size of a football field, and it's all poured concrete. Scattered about the sea of concrete are several piles of rubble where various small buildings used to stand. In the middle of it all are a pair of massive generators and a rounded turret-like structure that reminds me of that place in Star Wars where Luke lived with his Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru, the one on Tatooine. Anywho, inside this turret thing is a small vestibule and a heavy vault door. Beyond this door is a marble stairwell that descends to a second vault door, which finally leads to the core bunker facility. Here's where things get interesting. You enter a large oval chamber through the final door that Chalmers told me originally served as a security checkpoint, a place where badges were checked and personal belongings were stored. The original purchasers completely gutted the chamber and fashioned it into a sort of common area, which Hank then beefed up after buying it from them. In addition to installing a full kitchen and a full bar, he added a pool table, several fluffy sofas, and two 60-inch flat screens. Hanging off this ultra-awesome central hub are what Chalmers referred to as the facility's nine fingers, three full bathrooms, three rooms converted into bedrooms, a utility room, what used to be a communications room, and a library. No, Ellie, that's not a typo. There's a library here, a decent one at that, containing every manner of book imaginable. Novels, biographies, encyclopedias, high-level math and science texts, plus a whole slew of radio and communication manuals. Kooky shit, huh? I mean, Big Hank McAuley was no dum-dum, 
but I severely doubt the inclusion of such titles as Basic String Theory and The Wave Mechanics Almanac was his doing. My guess is the military left most of it behind when they skedaddled, and the first owners simply added to what they left. Crap, I need to get going. I have a two o'clock meeting with the Missoula PD. Forgot to tell you. They have several boxes full of Hank's effects. The stuff they snatched from the compound when they combed it for evidence. And they want me to come get it all. It's a half hour drive, so I better get moving. Love you, baby. I'll keep you posted. May 24, 526 PM. I tried calling when I was in town, but it just kept ringing. Guessing you went to lunch with the girls. Anyway, get this. The police had three boxes waiting for me. Inside the boxes were journals, stacks upon stacks of them, belonging to Hank and his two sons, Daryl and Jody, who lived in the bunker with Hank and served as his accomplices during the Hazelton Mall massacre. At first, I thought Detective Hamill was fucking with me. Hank, Daryl, and Jody McCauley writing in journals? But then he showed me some of the writings. He told me how they chronicled the men's deterioration in the months leading up to the mall disaster. I must have made a weird face because the guy grabbed my shoulder and recited some platitude about how we can't help who we're related to. Then he helped carry the boxes to the car and wished me well in the future. As I drove back, I started thinking about what the detective said, and it struck me that I truly am Hank McAuley's closest living relative. Of course, I knew this before. I just didn't think I'd ever fully processed what that meant. Well, process it I did, and as I approached the compound, I grew disgusted and furious, and decided I would burn everything associated with the Macaulays. The boxes, the compound, the land, just raise it all. However, as I parked the truck, I had an abrupt change of heart. I figured, fuck it. Why let this all go to waste? Besides, while I hate to admit it, Part of me is curious to know what was going on in Hank's head prior to his murdering 27 innocent people. So, rather than raise it all, I sat down with the journals and began reading. And reading. And reading. Baby, the Macaulays were far worse off than I ever knew worse than anyone other than the police ever knew. From what I've gleaned so far, the boys came to believe some seriously freaky shit near the end. Like, I'm slowly changing into something non-human freaky. Going by the dates recorded at the start of each journal entry, it all started about two months prior to the mall incident, right around the time they discovered something called the Red Room. I'm not sure what this red room is exactly, as I've only seen it mentioned a couple of times, but all three men seem to revere and despise it in equal measure. Well, that's about it for now. I'll do some more reading and get back to you soon. May 24, 9.13 p.m. Interesting quote from Hank's journal. We found the red room by accident, and because we are not cowardly, we went inside. In that cave-like place, which I reckon is somehow very far away, we saw things. Things that looked like red dust or moss. Things that moved. Damn fool that he is, Daryl decided to stir some of it up with his boot. Like dust will do, it flew up into the air, making a kind of red cloud, and we all breathed it in. We've all been coughing since, and all of our lungs hurt. Things feel different. I think we're infected now. 
In their journals, Daryl and Jody echo this infected claim, with each blaming the same red moss, and it only gets loopier from there. According to Hank's squirrely thinking, the infection was unlike anything humans had ever seen before. It could think and communicate like a human, and its onset was quite bizarre. Hank said it started subtly, producing symptoms that were actually quite pleasant. He claimed it felt like he was floating in a haze of nitrous oxide. The next phase was far less enjoyable, with the infection spreading slowly through the rest of his body and soul. As it spread, it stripped away all traces of civility until there was nothing left except the primal self. At this point, the journal entries become erratic and hard to follow. Outright gibberish. Yeah, I know. Crazy, right? Just keep in mind all of this comes with a fairly large caveat. When the police raided the bunker after the mall shooting, they found massive stores of prepackaged meth hidden in the storage shed located topside. My guess is the Macaulays were just blitzed out of their minds when they wrote in their journals. God damn it. There it is again. Sorry, Ellie. Something I need to go check on. May 24, 941 p.m. Sorry again. I'm fairly certain there's a problem with rabbits or gophers on the property. I've seen a bunch of holes topside, and I can sometimes hear the varmints tunneling through the earth beyond the bunker's walls. One wall in particular. The one at the back of the room that used to serve as the comm room. For some reason, the wall in there is whiter than the rest, like it has a fresher coat of paint. Yeah, yeah. As a writer, I see some freaky connections amongst everything I just recited, but come on now. If anything's freaky, it's that I used the word varmints, like I'm Yosemite fucking Sam. Speaking of writing, I've somehow managed to get a little writing done here. In my downtime, I've cranked out eight pages. Seems this place and all the red moss nonsense suits my muse. Hey, tell Katie I'm sorry about her nose. Keep letting her know it will heal correctly. Our poor honey. It has to be killing her that she can't play softball for three whole weeks. Thank God for the voice-to-text app on my phone. Typing this all out would be a bitch. Love you. I'll call later on when I head into town. May 27, 12.23 p.m. Quick email to say I'm okay. I honestly don't know what happened. I lost over a day and a half. Physically, I feel fine, so I doubt it's anything medical. Maybe there's noxious gas trapped in here or something. I don't know. I'm heading into town to call you. May 27, 9.56 p.m. In and out of the ER in record time. I love small town living. Much to my relief, the doc couldn't find anything wrong with me. When I was released, I asked around about getting the bunker tested for carbon monoxide and whatnot and wound up getting in touch with a local home inspector. I spoke with him and he agreed to bring his equipment today. He stayed for a couple of hours and didn't find anything unusual. Go figure. All right, it's been another long day. I am heading to bed. Love you. May 28, 3.56 p.m. Slept in. Had some weird-ass dreams. I managed to get some more writing done, several pages worth. After these last few days, though, I almost want to scrap the novel and start over with an idea based around the Macaulays. I won't, though. I'll keep it on ice until the next one but I seriously considered it. At least I don't have writer's block. May 28, 
7.11 p.m. Sorry I haven't called, but I've been busy. The white, white wall I spoke of before? It's vibrating softly. So softly it's almost imperceptible, but it's there. I felt it against my palms. I also tapped on the wall with my knuckles and found sounds and feels different from the other walls. Like it's hollow. Like there might be a hidden room on the other side. I recall seeing a sledgehammer in the tool shed up above. No phone call tonight. I have my work cut out for me. Love you. Talk in the morning. Kiss Katie for me and tell her I'm proud of her for not moping about the nose. May 29, 5.02 a.m. Took some work, but I broke through the wall last night. I was only partially right, Ellie. There is a hollow space beyond it, two feet's worth. But after that, there's another wall with a vault-style door, like the one up above. Believe me, my mind has been spinning. Obviously, the brothers Macaulay put the walls up before going on their kill-a-thon. And, obviously, the police missed it altogether. Fucking idiots. Granted, I'm sort of glad they missed it. Now I have a genuine mystery on my hands. I know, I know. Convention says I should notify the cops at once. But to hell with that. I discovered it, and I want to be the one to see what's inside. My hunch says it's just another room with nothing in it, like Al Capone's secret vault. But it also says anything is possible given the lengths the Macaulays went to conceal its existence. After a few hours sleep, I'm going to take down a lot more of the wall. See what's what. Talk to you when I know more. May 29, 8.33 a.m. Tore that fucker down! The whole damn thing! My next obstacle is to open the door. But to do that, I need a key. There's a key ring around here somewhere. One of the keys on it's bound to work. How wild is this? It's like one of those things you always hear about happening to someone else. Yet, here it is. Happening to me. May 29. 9.14 a.m. Can't find the key. Not a single one on the ring works. <sighs> Lost my shit big time and I'm forcing myself to calm down. May 29, 10.05 a.m. Quick update. I checked the boxes with journals and found Hank's car keys. On the ring was a funky-looking key, so I tried it, and it worked. Next up, going in. Wish me luck finding something cool. May 29, 10.57 a.m. Talk about a letdown. It's just a room. A big room, bigger than the rest with the lights still on. Except it's empty and there's nothing particularly special about it other than an odd smell like that of mold, grapes and rotten meat all rolled into one. I bet this was how Geraldo Rivera felt after breaking into Al Capone's secret vault. <sighs> Hang on. Dizzy all of a sudden. May 31, 4.32 a.m. Lost time again. I woke up an hour ago, but the phone was dead, so I had to charge it. I just got all your texts and emails. I'd like to say I'm okay, but something isn't right. What the fuck? I think I'm just going to pack up and leave. That makes the most sense. It shouldn't take long, just my clothes and laptop. 
which I now realize I left in the hidden room. All right, fuck it. I'll call you in a bit when I'm on the road. Love you, baby. May 31, 5.27 a.m. The Red Room exists, Ellie. It actually fucking exists. I've seen it. It's behind the door, in the walled-up room, hidden from sight. You can only see it if you walk to the far wall and turn around. I don't know how or why. I wouldn't have even noticed it if I hadn't turned the lights off on the way out after grabbing my laptop. See, when I shut the lighty lights off, it got darky dark in there, except not completely. <laughs> There was a pussy pink glow on the far wall with no apparent source. <laughs> and like a dummy dum dum, I wanted to have a look see. I went to the wall and touched it and glanced back. And there it was. Plain as day. The Red Room. How do you do? Very good, sir. How about you? May 31. 5.38 a.m. Sorry, got a case of the giggles for a minute, right out of the blue. I think I'm okay now. Christ. Back to what I was saying. When I turned around, I was confronted with a perfectly circular doorway about eight feet in diameter, which you can't see from any other angle in the room. Past the doorway is what can best be described as a large cave made of smooth, slightly translucent stone. All over the stone grow splotches of blood-red moss. At least, it resembles moss. Only this moss can move on its own. Slowly, but it can move. Theories abound in my mind as to what the fuck this is. Am I crazy for wanting to go into the Red Room? I'm attaching a pic I took. Yeah, I think I'm going to take a closer look. I have a feeling we have an epic discovery on our hands. Hugs and kisses for my missus. May 31, 5.55 a.m. Got to the doorway, but was too chicken shit to go through. I started to just leave, but then it happened. The best I can put it, the red moss reached out and let me know it was okay. Which means, yes, the red moss is alive. A thing capable of communication. Flip-flap Applejacks. We had a nice conversation, the Red Moss and me. It made me comfy and gave me quite the history lesson. It wants us to know because keeping it a secret doesn't matter. In a month or so, everyone will know. Here are the broad strokes of what it shared. The Air Force originally built the bunker as a hub to network the various missile silos scattered throughout Montana. In time, a better site took over as the hub, and the bunker's purpose shifted. It became a research, development, and experimentation station, performing tests presently being conducted at the CERN facility in Europe, just on a much smaller scale. Most of the experiments they conducted here were fruitless, save for the assay they ran involving particle acceleration. The moss says the assay caused a microscopic perforation in the universal fabric, which none of the testers ever noticed because the experiment ruined their equipment. The moss was able to reach through the perforation, but it couldn't communicate very well. Mostly just gave the techs headaches and nausea. Not that it had many chances. Following the incident, the government shut the program down and abandoned the bunker. For decades after that, it sat in mothballs. 
Then the government began selling off its unused properties to the highest bidder. Eventually, Hank McAuley came to be its owner. Before Hank and the boys' arrival, the perforation was relatively small, growing no bigger than a dime. This changed, however, five years after the Macaulays moved in. Evidently, my dipshit cousins had gotten into the business of making and selling homemade bombs to fellow doomsday enthusiasts. They stored them in the hidden room. One of them was poorly made and accidentally detonated there. Even though it was a small one, its blast set off a chain reaction the likes of which my brain cannot fully comprehend. The perforation slowly expanded. And because it originated counter to the far wall, its expansion went unnoticed until just a few months ago, when Hank happened upon the pink glow one evening while wandering drunkenly around the bunker. By then, it was the size of a doorway. Once the boys all saw it for themselves, they armed themselves with shotguns and marched right on in. The moss welcomed them. It explained itself as the apex of a species that had lived for billions of years in a world similar to ours but with the sun nearing implosion. It also revealed that the Red Room is not a room or cave, but a structure reminiscent of a communal home. Being of medial intelligence, the Macaulays fully ignored the scientific implications of what they had stumbled upon and instead began devising ways to exploit it. Jody, in particular, felt they could use the doorway to make a fortune by charging people to see it. Hank had other designs. He shared them with his boys, and soon enough, women from all over Montana started disappearing. Ah, crap, the battery's almost dead. May 31, 7.01 a.m. Plugged in and charging. So, yeah, those sons of bitches kidnapped teenage girls from all over, brought them down into the bunker, and... Well, let's leave it at that. They dumped their victims in the red room when they were finished with their debaucheries believing no one would ever find them. The moss has since grown over the bones, but it assures me it has preserved the skeletons. The moss has since grown over the bones, but it assures me it has preserved the skeletons. The flesh, formerly on the bones? It seems human cells contain a host of nutrients the moss finds useful. Oh boy. It's calling me. May 31, 7.25 a.m. Did something wrong. It wants me to start writing down all of this, like a testament. God, my lungs feel funny, like I'm breathing grains of sand. May 31, 7.42 p.m. Well rested and feeling good like that gorilla song. I'm happy, not feeling bad. I got sunshine all in a bag. I guess 12 hours of uninterrupted sleep will do that for a man. May 31, 8.18 p.m. Topside. I am thinking clearly again, but I'm a little nervous. Something's different. My chest. Breathing. Lungs are heavy, and it feels like the air is laced with microscopic razor blades. My head is starting to hurt too, and my memory of the day is spotty. I know I sent you an email. Beyond that, it's just fragmented. 
It's dark outside, so I've missed time again. There's something else, too. Underneath it all, I feel... different. Like on an atomic level. My hands don't feel like my own. Baby, I've got to get the hell out of here. Soon. May 31. 9.25 p.m. Down in a hole. I'm feeling so small. I was up above it. Now I'm down in it. Wait. I'm mixing up bands and lyrics. Alice in Chains and Nine Inch Nails. Alice in Nails. Nine Inch Chains. All the same, it's in me now. I am going for a test drive. It doesn't want to die when its sun goes white dwarf. I don't blame it. The test with my cousins didn't go so well. I don't think it's going well with me either. I'm feeling... sick. May 31, 10.48 p.m. Urges. 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 May 31, 11.13 p.m. I'm sorry, Ellie. I'm so sorry. Losing hold. I love you. I love Katie. Sweet Katie. I love... the moss. Not its fault. Stripping down inside. Layers are peeling off. Layers that I need. I think I see a path in my head. The way home. To you. To Katie. Leave. 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 Get out of the house. Oh, God. June 1. 9.55 a.m. Gee whiz, honey. Please, please ignore those last few messages. I got a bit drunk last night and... Wow. Really, I'm fine. You're fine. We're all fine around the mulberry bush. I'm on my way home now. I should be there in a few hours. I can't wait to see you... Call the cops! June 1, 3.36 p.m. Billings, you're not answering my calls. Thinking about your slender neck. June 1, 6.53 p.m. Casper. June 1, 11.29 p.m. Denver. Go Broncos. June 2. 1.34 a.m. Made it home. There were cops outside the house. I kept driving. Why aren't you answering your phone? Are you even home? June 2, 2.06 a.m. Going back. It needs us. It needs me to bring more to it. Lots of folks can go missing. I can't stand it much longer. Love you and Katie. 
maybe we'll see each other again. My head hurts, baby. It hurts so bad. Everyone will know soon. Run as far as you can. June 2, 4.23 a.m. Oh, God, Ellie. I just realized the door will remain open. Whether it comes through or not, the door will remain open, and it will only get bigger. Do you know what happens when a star collapses? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. It won't be fast. It won't be fast at all. June 2, 1217 PM. It's all on fire now. The cave. The bunker. The whole thing. It's screaming in my head. Stripping me away. I can feel it. It hurts. Tell Katie I'm sorry. So sorry. Daddy tried in the end. He really did. Uh, how it hurts. Call someone, anyone. The door is still open. You've been listening to The Red Room by author W.B. Stickle. Tonight's episode featured a tale from the very talented Horror Hill newcomer, W.B. Stickle. The Red Room was written by and presented courtesy of W.B. Stickle. Newcomer W.B. Stickle hails from one of the original 13 colonies, the land of the Liberty Bell, cheesesteaks, and the chocolate capital of the USA. That's right, Pennsylvania. More of his work can be found on Goodreads and Amazon by searching his name, W.B. Stickle. That's W-B-S-T-I-C-K-E-L. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at Jason's audiobooks, available now on audible.com. Check out the link in the show notes for Jason's ever-growing library of audiobooks. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in.
Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted, and its feature tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda. Finalization by Craig Groshek and N.M. Brown. Artwork by the amazing Omega Black. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave a kind comment. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 